the perfect fall guy, why the next crisis is inevitable and unstoppable the reality, alas, is a bit different from the expectation. And while most mainstream media outlets still choose to deny an upcoming global economic collapse, all factors point towards a new crisis, the arrival of which is now no longer a matter of opinion, but a matter of time. When the economic crash does send tremors through the world's financial infrastructure and quakes the shaky ground upon which the current system stands, the culprits along with the same media outlets that previously denied the collapse will look for a scapegoat that would take the blame for all of the world's misfortunes. Blame, of course, is never about identifying the true faults at the root of a problem, for in such case it would no longer be blame, but reason. Reason would require one to take an in-depth look into every factor that, throughout history and through every individual contributor, has brought upon the catastrophe at hand. Without a doubt, it would be a long and complicated study that would rob those who benefit from public outrage of their power to direct the fury of the masses where it is most profitable. Therefore, in order to benefit from the scapegoat and the angrier tension it reaps, the facts must be left obscure and the blame must be bestowed upon something or someone specific and symbolic, a single target that is easy to hate, a perfect fall guy readily condemned for every disaster. Such a perfect fall guy was made available by the election of Donald Trump as the President of the United States of America. Despite all of its ongoing financial challenges, despite the precarious foundation of the dollar's global dominion, despite its levels of debt that are currently reaching unprecedented heights, the U.S. is still the number one economy in the world in terms of nominal GDP, constituting nearly one-fourth of the world's gross product. On one hand, it puts the United States in the prestigious position as the international superpower. On the other, it also puts the United States right in the eye of the storm of every global financial crisis. Consequently, its leader, the president, is inevitably expected to be held accountable by the international community whenever something goes wrong and the U.S. is involved. The ideal scapegoat for a collapse considering the role that the petrodollar played in propelling the United States to supremacy and the role that it will play in the forthcoming collapse when its artificial value crumbles at last, the U.S. will find itself right at the core of the inferno and Donald Trump will have to answer for it all, making him the ideal scapegoat. The fact that he is perhaps one of the most controversial and, arguably, disliked people in global mainstream media at the moment only further solidifies President Trump's position as the fall guy who will catch the blame for the collapse of a system that had long been ready to fail. Donald Trump's anti-establishment rhetoric is part of what has garnered his populist support, his promise to undo the system that had wronged the people for the sake of globalist profit. However, his ascension to the presidency of the United States was not only welcomed by his supporters but also by the very establishment that he vowed to dismantle. The fact of the matter is that these special interests saw in him the perfect opportunity to fashion a scapegoat that would take all the heat for their shortcomings that have been detrimental to the health and stability of both the American and worldwide economy. Of course, there is no doubt that Donald Trump is far from a saint and whilst even that may sound like a bold understatement, the issue with pinning the blame for all of the world's dollar on one person is that much of the actual causes and thus also solutions to the crisis will go unnoticed in the midst of the furious uproar against the United States' most abhorred leader. While the mainstream media crucifies Donald Trump for everything that he did and did not do, the deeply rooted problems of this economic system will not be properly addressed and without taking into account all of the genuine reasons that bring upon this tremendous global debt disaster. It will hinder both the recovery and the learning experience that should make of this crisis a lesson for the future. Instead, it would be wise to consider just what is it exactly that has landed the world's leading superpower into the gutter and the answer is unfortunately not as simple as Donald Trump. The reality of our current shabby state of affairs owes its misfortune to the continued mismanagement of U.S. finances by previous administrations a practice that has been ongoing for now over three decades and has ultimately resulted in an accumulation of debt that can simply no longer be sustained nor averted, thus it can only end in a grand fiasco that will be the upcoming crisis. Glass-Steagall repeal a disaster amongst the notable causes of the financial malady whose symptoms we suffer right now is the 1999 repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, an act that, in the wake of the Great Depression, was passed in order to keep commercial banks from investing in the stock market due to the fact that they gambled excessively with the money of their depositors and thus undermined stability. 
When the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed by the Bill Clinton administration, banks, in a fit of greed, chose to disregard the lessons that could have been learned from the failures of investment bankers in 1907 and engaged into risky ventures that ultimately resulted in the real estate bubble and the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2008. Following the financial panic of 2008, Barack Obama signed the Dodd-Frank Act into federal law on July 21, 2010. Highly unpopular amongst the Republicans due to an amount of constraints but true, the bill foisted burdensome regulations that crushed smaller financial institutions while letting big banks get only bigger. Furthermore, the Dodd-Frank Act empowered the Federal Reserve, which is, arguably, the most prominent of culprits in American financial misadventures. Derivatives, entitlements, liabilities The American economy has also suffered a good deal at the hands of entitlement programs such as Medicare, Obamacare more precisely, and Social Security that, throughout the years, through the course of taxation off-balance. While accessible medical care is certainly not a bad concept, the way in which it was executed left the economy and the success of President in a rather difficult place. The primary issue with the Medicare system is related directly to demographics, seeing as it is a relatively recent system, effective as of March 23, 2010, the amount that is contributed to it by senior citizens is much smaller than the price of the benefits they will receive. With a majority of baby boomers that will soon be retiring, the output of funds will far exceed the input, thus making this arrangement unsustainable and detrimental to the economy. These are just some of the factors that have genuinely paved the way for the impending crisis that is ahead. Add to it the central bank schemes of expansion, contraction of credit and interest rate manipulations and we have ourselves the perfect recipe for disaster. The Keynesian model that has dominated American economics throughout the years and the machinations of the Federal Reserve are at the root of the problem. Just like Obama did not cause the financial crisis of 2007 to 2008 but did inherit it, Trump will be left with an even bigger package, one that he likely won't be able to do anything about. It will be quite easy to point the finger and hold him responsible for the downfall of the U.S. economy, but that would only divert the blame from the actual perpetrators. The libertarian, anti-establishment, populist movement that was spearheaded by Donald Trump would be deemed as the cause of the collapse, but one must be wary of opposing such sentiment, for the response to it would be a regime that is far more authoritarian, a regime that empowers a government directed by central banks and big corporations, where the liberty of citizens is forsaken in favor of forced policies, leading to the confiscation of wealth and the perpetuation of new conflicts. Donald Trump is no martyr, but to play into his role as the perfect fall guy would mean to turn a blind eye on the real issues that plague the American economy. The War on Cash the list goes on in the spectrum of what cash can purchase is well nigh limitless. Cash is the physical form of currency that has been around for millennia, with commercial use dating as far back as the classical antiquity in the form of coins that were minted out of valuable metals in order to facilitate trade. By the early Middle Ages, Venetian merchants have adopted the use of paper bills that represented payments due to be made by their banker in the form of silver bars, and thus the concept of paper for metal was born. Nowadays, little thought is given to the worth of metal behind the paper bills and the currency itself has grown to represent other values, such as credit and debt, a legal tender, as it is in the case of the US dollar. Regardless of what is it that really backs the worth of cash, throughout history, we have become so reliant on paper currency that it is hard to ID the world without it, a world where cash no longer constitutes the tangible portion of one's wealth. However, Considering the technological advancement and all of the changes brought upon us by the age of information, it would make sense to reflect upon that thought, for the war on cash is more than just a possibility, it is becoming a reality and few seem to notice that the process is already underway. Just recently, the price of gold in India has skyrocketed up to $2,294 used per ounce and its sudden rise in demand has depleted many of the stores across the country. The reason for such a rapid increase in appetite for gold is attributed to the Indian government's ban of 500 and 1,000 rupee banknotes, effective as of the 8th of November 2016, consequently rendering a great deal of current money practically illegal as an attempt to eliminate corruption and make counterfeit banknotes unusable. 
Inevitably, economic uncertainty has engulfed individuals and businesses alike and as people swarmed the banks in the wake of the ban, almost half of the country's 202,000 atoms were out of new notes. While India's finance minister Arun Jaitley has exhorted people to resort to check use, cards and electronic transfers during the period of transition, none of these seemed as convincing as tangible wealth, and Indians were quick to rush for gold and cash. A war on private wealth earlier this year. In May, the governing council of the European Central Bank has made the decision to permanently take the 500 euro banknote out of production in 2018. While the 500 euros bill will preserve its value as a legal tender and the consequences of its removal are nowhere nearly as dramatic as the events that shook the Indian economy, it is yet another step on the path of taking cash out of circulation. The issue with the withdrawal of the 500 euro note is a lot more subtle. As the European Central Bank has imposed negative interest rates on commercial banks, charging them interest on the reserves that they keep within the ECB, those banks began to apply the same practice to their customers, effectively ruining their savings. Naturally, the simplest individual solution to this problem is to keep savings in physical cash. This is where the 500 euros banknote comes in particularly handy, because one can store a great deal of wealth in a small space, which the central bank obviously does not want because the banking system functions on a high number of deposits and a substantially smaller number of withdrawals, therefore it depends on those savings to fuel its endless loop of bonds and loans. If people were to opt for independent savings as a result of negative interest rates, the banks would lose the funds that they gamble with, so them taking out high denomination bank notes serves the purpose of preventing such a scenario from taking place. Europe's digital president Sweden is well on its way towards becoming an entirely cashless society within the next decade, increasingly swapping cash transfers for payments by either card or phone. Swedish public transit no longer accepts tangible currency and retailers have the legal right to decline notes and coins. More than a half of the 1,600 bank branches that operate in Sweden have given up on cash reserves and do not accept cash deposits anymore. Applications such as Swish, developed in accordance with Swedish major banks, now allow smartphone users to transfer money between accounts at will, effectively replacing cash payment for individuals and businesses alike. Sales have significantly increased thanks to the simplicity of payment via systems such as Azetal, that allows traders to accept money through a smartphone application fitted with a card reader. While such an approach has made the transfer of money a lot more convenient, the shift to a cashless society has also resulted in concerns about fraud and privacy. The UK itself seems not to tag too far behind on the path towards a cash-free economy, actively transitioning to contactless payments in many aspects of people's lives. The tendency amongst younger consumers is to pay digitally, through the phone or the card and businesses are quick to adapt to this trend, while the producers of new technologies are eager to capitalize on the digital revolution. Despite the rampant type of a cashless society, it is important to consider all of the implications of this phenomenon before jumping on the cash-free bandwagon. As convenient as digital transfers may appear at a first glance, they ensnare your wealth within a system that is regulated by banks, and a look at the ECB's policies should make it clear that they do not have your best interest in mind. On the other hand, in the best interest of central banks and governments, a society that functions without cash saves them from the cost of issuing transporting and storing coins and notes. To demonetize a nation and transition to a cashless society would necessarily force everyone to deposit their funds into the banking system, consequently increasing bank profits. Governments and central banks would enjoy a new, undisputed freedom to implement regulations and to control the capital. Considering the questionable safety of the banks due to their gambling nature, Considering the frail state of the economy and the upcoming collapses across the globe, courtesy of their short-sighted decisions, it makes no sense to consciously leave them in charge of your personal finances. The problem with a cashless world is society, whose financial transactions in their entirety are large as data, offers an unprecedented opportunity for control to those who hold the reins of the system that is used to process this data. The trail of digital currency can be analyzed and a person's purchases can be used to build a profile of their habits. Such technology already exists and this can be observed in the shape of credit card companies issuing fraud warnings for transactions that are deemed to be way out of the cardholder's recorded pattern. 
While this currently serves the purpose of protecting the customer, it is not hard to imagine how such a system can be abused. In the scenario of a cashless society, this data would extend to every single purchase, to every transaction made by an individual. An access to information of these proportions offers an unparalleled control over the person, which is not only a threat to privacy, but a direct attack on private wealth. Banks, governments and technological giants definitely have a lot to gain. Individuals and entrepreneurs, on the other hand, will end up having to dance to their flute. Cash offers freedom, the freedom to manage your finances independently, the freedom to conduct business on your own terms, the freedom of commerce that constitutes the core of capitalism. Give that freedom up and leave the government with the power to make decisions for every single citizen and you may well have a system that is no better than a socialist regime, where opportunities for individual prosperity are heavily regulated and the entirety of a nation's wealth resides within the hands of those that run the show. If we have learned anything from history is that state socialism never worked in the favor of the people, because centralized, limitless power is too irresistible not to abuse. Instead of empowering the same institutions that have repeatedly lead the economy to one crisis after another, the economic system must empower entrepreneurs, the people that produce wealth, not the people that gamble with it. In order to see this through, we need freedom and until the banks can prove themselves trustworthy, this freedom is tangible currency. Reason would require one to take an in-depth look into every factor that, throughout history and through every individual contributor, has brought upon the catastrophe at hand. Without a doubt, it would be a long and complicated study that would rob those who benefit from public outrage of their power to direct the fury of the masses where it is most profitable. Therefore, in order to benefit from the scapegoat and the angrier tension it reaps, the facts must be left obscure and the blame must be bestowed upon something or someone specific and symbolic, a single target that is easy to hate, a perfect fall guy readily condemned for every disaster. Such a perfect fall guy was made available by the election of Donald Trump as the President of the United States of America. Despite all of its ongoing financial challenges, despite the precarious foundation of the dollar's global dominion, Despite its levels of debt that are currently reaching unprecedented heights, the U.S. is still the number one economy in the world in terms of nominal GDP, constant to fail. Donald Trump's anti-establishment rhetoric is part of what has garnered his populist support, his promise to undo the system that had wronged the people for the sake of globalist profit. However, his ascension to the presidency of the United States was not only welcomed by his supporters, but also by the very establishment that he vowed to dismantle. The fact of the matter is that these special interests saw in him the perfect opportunity to fashion a scapegoat that would take all the heat for their shortcomings that have been detrimental to the health and stability of both the American and worldwide economy. Of course, there is no doubt that Donald Trump is far from a saint and whilst even that may sound like a bold understatement, the issue with pinning the blame for all of the world's dollar on one person is that much of the actual causes and thus also solutions to the crisis would go unnoticed in the midst of the furious uproar against the United States' most abhorred leader. While the mainstream media crucifies Donald Trump for everything that he did and did not do, the deeply rooted problems of this economic sitting nearly one-fourth of the world's gross product. On one hand, it puts the United States in the prestigious position as the international superpower. On the other, it also puts the United States right in the eye of the storm of every global financial crisis. Consequently, its leader, the president, is inevitably expected to be held accountable by the international community whenever something goes wrong and the U.S. is involved. The ideal scapegoat for a collapse considering the role that the petrodollar played in propelling the United States to supremacy and the role that it will play in the forthcoming collapse when its artificial value crumbles at last. The U.S. will find itself right at the core of the inferno and Donald Trump will have to answer for it all, making him the ideal scapegoat. The fact that he is perhaps one of the most controversial and, arguably, disliked people in global mainstream media at the moment only further solidifies President Trump's position as the fall guy who will catch the blame for the collapse of a system that had long been ready to
the perfect fall guy, why the next crisis is inevitable and unstoppable the reality, alas, is a bit different from the expectation and while most mainstream media outlets still choose to deny an upcoming global economic collapse, all factors point towards a new crisis, the arrival of which is now no longer a matter of opinion, but a matter of time. When the economic crash does send tremors through the world's financial infrastructure and quakes the shaky ground upon which the current system stands, the culprits along with the same media outlets that previously denied the collapse will look for a scapegoat that would take the blame for all of the world's misfortunes. Blame, of course, is never about identifying the true faults at the root of a problem, for in such case it would no longer be blame, but reason system will not be properly addressed and without taking into account all of the genuine reasons that bring upon this tremendous global debt disaster. It will hinder both the recovery and the learning experience that should make of this crisis a lesson for the future. Instead, it would be wise to consider just what is it exactly that has landed the world's leading superpower into the gutter and the answer is unfortunately not as simple as Donald Trump. The reality of our current shabby state of affairs owes its misfortune to the continued mismanagement of U.S. finances by previous administrations a practice that has been ongoing for now over three decades and has ultimately resulted in an accumulation of debt that can simply no longer be sustained nor averted, thus it can only end in a grand fiasco that will be the upcoming crisis. Glass-Steagall repeal a disaster amongst the notable causes of the financial malady whose symptoms we suffer right now is the 1999 repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, an act that, in the wake of the Great Depression, was passed